The story begins with several meteors flying in outer space. They seem to be heading towards Earth. During the opening credits, we see two young ladies traveling together. The two are briefly engaged in a gunfight with their supposed nemesis. The scene changes to show a van being driven along an open road. The woman in the passenger seat holds a big crucifix, and a restrained girl lies in the back. Eventually, the van arrives at a house. The man who is driving takes the restrained girl out to carry her in. After he lays her on a bed, the woman injects her with a syringe. Then they enter another room, where they read a passage from the Bible in unison. They recite how they are giving blood upon an altar to make an atonement for their souls. Apparently, the duo wants to cleanse themselves of all the filthiness of flesh and spirit. Once they are done with the recitation, they return to the girl. The man lifts her up and places her inside a bathtub before taking out a knife. When he stabs her with it, the woman near him flinches. The man follows this by taking out a hatchet and hacking the girl's arm off with it. Her leg comes next. The woman helps by disposing of the severed limbs into a garbage bag. Later, she washes the blood inside the bathtub. Subsequently, we see chunks of meat being cooked, making us wonder if it's from the girl. As the duo sits at the table, they say grace before consuming the meat. The woman is Liz, and the man is her son Darby. At a different hour, a meteor falls near their house, causing it to shake from the impact. Liz has to close the cabinet doors that have flown open due to the shaking. At night, the son lies in the same bed with his mother while they watch the news. It mentions the many meteors that have fallen to Earth. In the next scene, the uncanny duo arrives at a remote location. Darby is carrying a few bags that very likely contain whose life they took. It seems like they rode out there to bury the bags. As they ride back, they listen to an evangelist program on the radio. The speaker says everyone is born into the world with an evil savage creature within them. It possesses one's mind and spirit. Meanwhile, Liz sees two people walking on the side of the road, which prompts her to get her son's attention. The people happen to be the two young ladies that we saw during the opening credits. Thus, Darby turns the van around to drive up to them. Once the van draws near the girls, Liz asks them if they need a ride. The travelers can't reject the offer, and they gratefully get inside. Interestingly, the windows in the back seat are covered with paper, which adds to the eerie scenario. Inside the van, Liz introduces herself along with her son. One of the girls calls herself Rose, prior to introducing her friend Ursula. The latter says they need to go as far west as they can. Liz asks the girls when was the last time they had a bath and a hot meal. Apparently it's been a while, so Liz invites them to their home. Ursula doesn't want to bother them, but Liz insists. Following this, the group enters the same house where a girl's life was taken. Liz informs their guests that it's been their home for almost 25 years. After the girls give Liz their heavy clothes, Darby says they have two showers upstairs and offers to lead the way. This causes the girls to look at each other somewhat oddly before they follow him. Once they enter the first washroom, we notice it's the one where the girl was butchered earlier. Rose picks this one for herself. The moment her friend leaves with Darby, she starts looking through the drawers, harmlessly exploring. Ursula gets taken to a slightly darker washroom. Darby tells the girl to take her time. Meanwhile, Liz is preparing a syringe that she will use on the poor girls. Her son comes to the woman, gesturing for her to stay quiet with a smile. She tells him, God has been very kind to them. She also mentions how neither of their guests has a cell phone. Then she says something disturbing, which confirms what they do to people. She says the girls look somewhat thin, but should still last them for some time. So Liz and her son did girl in the beginning. Switching back to Rose, she continues to search inside the drawers until she finds a jar of money. Soon Ursula enters the room to tell Rose that she didn't find anything. More importantly, she thinks they should flee. Rose agrees with her. However, she still found something valuable. Her elation is short-lived when she catches sight of bloodstains on the bathtub. This discovery prompts her to look at Ursula, who is equally confused. Back to the homeowners, Darby asks his mom how she wants to do it. First, she wants to get the girls to stay the night. If they refuse, they will have to be separated. Since the girls refuse to eat, Liz says they will have to do something the old-fashioned way. Whatever she means by this, hearing it puts an eerie smile on Darby's face. The woman is also doubling the dosage that she intends to inject them with. When Rose and Ursula make their way downstairs, Liz compliments their looks. Rose thanks her for everything but says they need to get back on the road. She even refuses Liz's invitation for them to stay the night. The woman expresses her disappointment, lying that it would have been nice to know the girls better. Once Liz leaves, her son says they have to excuse her, since they don't get many visitors. The woman returns with Rose's and Ursula's hats. She thinks Darby should take Ursula elsewhere, so she can pick out a new one for herself. After she leaves with him, 
Rose stays with Liz. The woman tells Rose she had a daughter, named Lily, who passed away two years ago. We see a photo of the girl. Liz also says that Lily wasn't well in the head. She starts to cry, cryptically saying the girl lost her life of her It is the greatest mortal sin to do this. As she keeps talking, we see Ursula picking out a hat with Darby. The man takes out a syringe and gets ready to inject her with it. At the same time, Liz readies her syringe to inject Rose. They seem to inject the unsuspecting girls simultaneously. Rose gets filled with fury, threatening to take Liz's life before she almost loses consciousness. The two girls fall to the floor. They try to crawl away, but the dosage they have just received is heavy. Then a restrained Rose gets taken to a bed and Liz gives her an extra injection. It's not her that the deranged duo want to start with first. They come to her restrained friend in another room. Darby lifts her and carries her to the bathtub, where we know what he intends to do. His mother surprises him with the news that they're out of cleaning supplies, so she has to go to town to acquire some. After she leaves, he takes out the knife to stab Ursula with. Moving along, he uses the hatchet to sever her arm. However, this time he experiences something bizarre. Despite having removed it, he sees her arm is still attached to the rest of her, as if he never hacked it off. Thus, he cuts it off a second time, only to observe the inexplicable weirdness again. This forces Darby to kneel and ask her who she is. At that moment, Rose enters the room, asking him if he means to ask what they are. She reveals her sharp teeth before jumping on him. The man has messed with the wrong girls. In the next scene, Darby is lying lifeless in his bathtub while the girls talk to each other. Ursula says it hurt very much to have her arm hacked off. We learn more about who they are. When Rose reminds her friend of what happened in the year 1876, they were in Bulgaria and Rose got speared through the back. Following this, Rose retrieves their backpacks and takes out a wooden stake from one of them. She holds the stake open for Ursula to strike it with a mallet. Rose wants his mom to witness the gruesomeness once she returns. Soon Liz arrives back home. She enters and starts calling out to her son. She's curious why he's not answering. She walks into the washroom and witnesses the despicable sight of her lifeless son. Seeing her deceased son, Liz becomes fearful and runs downstairs. She collects a gun and sees the girls approaching her. Rose tells Liz that she kind of liked her, but what the woman did to them was very twisted. Shooting the girls, Liz is unable to do any fatal damage to them. They take her life too and drive a stake through her, just as they did with her wicked son. Taking Liz's necklace off, Ursula puts it on Rose. Then Ursula opens a freezer elsewhere and retrieves a plastic-covered head from it. She asks Rose if the people whose lives they just took. Rose confirms her assumption, and the two start laughing, oddly finding humor in this uncanny situation. Later, they occupy the bathtub, which is now full of Rose complains that it was too easy for these people to bring them down. It's embarrassing to her, causing her to wonder how they let this happen. They cannot allow such a situation to happen again. Ursula thinks their senses have dulled a lot over the last few decades. Rose thinks that the blood they feed on has become poisonous because everyone is on nowadays. At this point, there is no doubt about the two girls being savage vampires. Currently drinking though, is the purest they have had in years. Ursula says, it was easy for them in the old days before science and technology made it hard. Rose hopes for a global power grid shutdown. She wants humanity to return to the Dark Ages. That is the time she thinks they will become free. We learn today is Rose's birthday, and she is an impressive 426 years old. Once she awakens in the morning, she has to put on sunglasses. She checks if her friend is beside her, but she isn't. Ursula is in another room, listening to an old-fashioned radio. Upon seeing Rose, Ursula tells her they have a problem. They listen to the radio informing them of the meteors that have fallen on Earth. Many people have witnessed organisms hatching from them. Soon, a reporter at a crashed meteor site starts talking, describing the site to the best of his abilities. The girls learn the site is 11 minutes fresh. The meteor emanates a green mist and cracks open like an egg. The reporter sees two tentacles attached to what looks like a sea creature to him. When it starts to levitate, chaos ensues. The reporter screams that it's coming closer to him. It doesn't take long for it to sound like he has lost his life. Rose can't believe what is happening. The original newsman says, if a person gets bitten by one of those aliens, the person becomes a savage predator, making this situation even more dangerous. The broadcast ends with the aliens breaking into the news station to cause destruction. Afterward, the two girls get down to business. They each collect a gun and exit the house they have cleansed. Once they come to the van, they hear screaming in the distance. Rose wants to see what is going on. The duo starts walking in the direction of the scream, with their guns pointing ahead. 
In a short time, they see an unknown creature on top of a person. Rose confusedly asks what it is, but their attention is diverted by the scream. Walking further, the girls encounter more of the bizarre creatures floating in the air. They fire a few shots at the creatures. Alas, the bullets don't seem to do much damage. Other than the floating aliens, the people walking nearby look like zombies. This is Rose's and Ursula's cue to flee. We watch how the zombies chase them back to the house, where the girls hide safely. Suddenly, they hear something break in the house, prompting them to head toward the noise. Two zombies seem to have entered, yet the duo bravely deals with them. In the scuffle, one of the zombies bites Ursula, and something starts happening to her. It seems like she is turning into one of the despicable creatures. However, it's just her having fun, playing a joke on her friend. She shows Rose how her bite mark has disappeared, and the latter realizes they are immune to zombie infections. Still, the aliens are a phenomenon that Rose very much wants to avoid dealing with. Ursula thinks they are experiencing the end of the world. Being optimistic, Rose offers the possibility that it could be a new beginning. She says there are many bad people in the world, and the penance is long overdue. Soon the duo hears guns firing, prompting them to look out the window. Of all people, they observe a priest and a nun running away from the zombies while firing guns. In no time, the church people knock on the front door that the girls open for them. The priest thanks them for saving their lives. He introduces himself as Father Cooper. His companion is Sister Gigi, who is mute. Cooper asks if Liz is there with her son, and Ursula, lying through her teeth, says they left hours ago. Now he wants to know who the girls are. Rose tells him the truth, that they were picked up by the homeowners. She follows those words with a lie, by saying they are really fine people. Cooper adds to the lie, saying they are the most saintly people in the community. Changing the topic, he says the zombies have to be shot not only in the head, but specifically in the pineal gland. He educates the girls that the gland produces DMT, which is the spirit molecule. He thinks the zombies are attacking the living, because they're trying to get back what was extracted from them. Furthermore, the priest says the creatures who invaded the planet are soul takers. At this point, Ursula questions how Cooper knows so much about what's going on. To the priest, this isn't amazing, for he claims this has been known since 79 AD. Then he gets on his knees to passionately talk about a happening from the Bible. The churchman sounds certain that Satan's army has emerged onto the earth. After speaking with Zest about the topic, he falls to the floor. The girls simply cannot believe this crazy man. At night, we observe zombies surrounding the house, aliens levitating in the air, and meteors falling. It is a real spectacle to behold. Inside, Rose asks Cooper how they destroy the aliens, but he does not know. All he knows is, God's design is such that they cannot run or hide anywhere. Suddenly, he stands while holding his crucifix in the air to pray for forgiveness. Following this, he starts sprinkling holy water all over the house. As he does, he discovers Darby with his mom, lying in a small room. Looking at the girls, Cooper asks them what they have done. Jiggy points her double guns at them. Rose says he needs to learn more about his friends by looking in their freezer, since he refuses to. Ursula informs him that the people he spoke highly about were cannibals. At this moment, he thinks he knows who these strangers are, a pair of feminists. The priest arrives at that conclusion by comically naming certain traits about them. He wants them out of the house and keeps saying insulting things about the girls. Eventually, he manages to land on the truth by calling them vampires. The girls respond by showing their sharp teeth, prompting Jiggy to shoot them down, but they stand back up with reddened eye. Cooper attempts to perform an exorcism on them and stops once they point their guns at him. Although gunfire takes place, it isn't from the girls. They all enter the adjacent room to witness Gigi getting attacked by zombies. The girls eliminate the zombies to save the nun. Due to that action, the church people are no longer hostile towards them. The two groups go their separate ways, and it doesn't take long for more zombies to start attacking them. Cooper's life tragically ends at the hands of an unholy zombie. Even Rose receives real damage. The zombie who attacked her was wearing a crucifix that touched Rose. Being a vampire, that is one of the ways she can approach her demise. Subsequently, we see the zombie who took Cooper's life, now consuming his With this action, it looks like the zombie's soul forcefully leaves him, shooting through the roof. Cooper was probably right about what he spoke of earlier. While this unfolds, an alien descends on Gigi, causing her to foam at the mouth. Soon, the vampire duo sees the changed nun stand in front of them. We get the impression it's going to be a challenge to deal with her, but they simply shoot her in the head and keep moving. Finally, the duo exits the house a second time and gets inside the van. As they ride for an unknown amount of time, they observe a dozen aliens flying ahead. 
Thankfully, they don't hinder the girls from arriving at their next destination. The two are forced to stop due to the van running out of fuel. They enter a random house with caution. There is blood on the floor for them to see. Rose kneels to inspect it and says the liquid is fresh. They keep walking in the darkness and find an injured alien on the floor. Ursula says it's deceased. She cautiously touches it to be certain. We see a dart in the alien, meaning someone must have shot it. Later, Ursula cuts the alien in the location of the dart with a knife and fork. Thinking this activity is foul, Rose goes away to sit near the active fireplace. Ursula reaches into the slimy opening to retrieve something interesting. She wants her friend to see it, but Rose would rather not. Inspecting the thing closely, Ursula starts attributing parts of the brain to it. Supposedly, that's what the structure she took out is. This late in the film, we learn Ursula is knowledgeable in biology. The other parts of the alien organ seem like they belong to a heart. From this, Ursula concludes the organ is simultaneously a brain and a heart. That is the reason the alien lost its life. Someone shot it in the right place. After Ursula takes out the dart, she yelps because she thinks a bug bit her. She collects a small organism off her neck and examines it. When Rose directs herself toward her friend, she quickly gets afflicted by the same problem. Thus she falls to and sees an alien descend on her, like it did on Gigi. As both of the vampires lie with an alien on top of them, they foam at the mouth. Come morning, Ursula wakes up coughing. Once she notices a hole in her chest, she crawls to Rose, who has the same hole. She wants her to wake up, but the poor girl doesn't. Ursula starts crying. All she can do is rest on her friend and mourn. Eventually, she sees Rose has one eye open, saying now they are even. Clearly the two have the same weird sense of humor. Of course, Ursula screams in frustration. She even wants to take Rose's life for playing such a joke. Soon, Rose calmly announces the aliens are gone. She adds that she and Ursula lack the one quality that the aliens look for in a person. Ursula realizes the special quality is the soul, proving Cooper was correct again. Finally, their curse proved to be a blessing. The two see crossbows on the wall, which they acquire. Outside the house, they observe several aliens flying above and shoot them down with their new weapons. Rose shoots Ursula in the shoulder by accident, sparking a squabble between them for a short time. Afterward, the vampires stand on the road, with Rose saying it will be a long walk. As they start the journey, Rose asks what they are going to do when all the humans are annihilated by the aliens. This is a concern because they survive on human blood. Ursula says there are thousands of banks harboring blood in the USA alone. She thinks that will be enough to feed them for at least one more century. In the process of walking, Rose exclaims, this is the worst birthday ever. 